Okay, welcome everyone to ARCI's video meeting number 14. Here we are on the 18th of September, 2021. And I'm pleased to be here today with a great group of people online and two awesome presentations lined up. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. We've got members of ARCI attending as well as members of clubs from around the country. So thank you all for attending. I'd also like to all put out a uh, request to consider that you should be a presenter. It's, it's uh, uh, what makes this whole meeting tick is having people that have pr presentations to uh, bring to these meetings and it's pretty easy to do. And so uh, Matt will put out a poll later on uh, that will ask if you'd like to be a presenter. So please consider that. Our next meeting will be uh, October 16th. We're at present, we're back to the once per month schedule. We didn't, didn't have a meeting last month uh, in August, but we're back on the cadence of once a month. And if you have any feedback or any ideas, there's the email in front of you that you can uh, email us. And uh, as you may have heard, the the, uh, the Zoom voice said that we are recording these meetings and we put them on YouTube. So you can go find those on our YouTube channel uh, for Archie. It's pretty easy to, to be a presenter. We have prearranged times roughly for people to be presenters and do show and tells. And uh, the main thing to do is if you're not doing actively presenting, then please stay on mute. So now I'm going to turn it over to Matt, who's going to give us a brief uh, overview of what it means uh, that we're on YouTube. So uh, we are on YouTube, and uh, because of that, we have to remember that uh, anything that we release gets released to the general public. So, um, you know, please be careful not to say or show anything that you wouldn't want anyone on YouTube to see. Uh, particularly for YouTube, we have to pay attention to copyrighted material, and they're very sensitive to copyrighted music. So if you're showing your radio collection, uh, please don't have it on a music station and playing songs in the background, because I'll have to spend a lot of time trying to edit that out so our YouTube doesn't get striked. Other than that, uh, you know, the, the key information uh, is on the screen here. If you have confidential things that you want to share with the group, but not with YouTube, uh, put them in chat. As an example, I've already posted in chat uh, next month's invitation to register for, for our meeting. And as a courtesy from Mark, I've also included uh, the invitation for their tomorrow the, the, the Zoom and Facebook version of their meeting tomorrow in uh, David's, Davidsville, I think is how you say it. Uh, I'm sure Brian can correct me on that. Uh, but that's it. Stay on mute. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Matt. Okay, so today we have two presentations lined up. You can see them there. Um, after the presentations, um, we will have a, uh, uh, a show and tell section and then followed by the uh, a little update on swap meets and then the items wanted items for sale. So with that being said, I will turn it over to uh, Brian Belange, who's done a presentation for us before on their wonderful museum out east. And today he's going to talk about the history of RCA. So we're all looking forward to that. Well, thank you. Thank you, Tom. And uh, thank you for inviting me to speak. It's always an honor to be asked to uh, be one of your presenters. So let me uh, see if I can get my screen shared here with you. All right. Can you, Matt, can you yeah. see the uh, first slide? Yes, full screen. Okay. So the topic today is a history of RCA, a very interesting company. One that we've all heard about, but uh, sometimes there's some kind of behind the scenes stories that are quite interesting. 
This first slide shows some of the uh, different logos that have been used over the year. The one at the very bottom, the Worldwide Wireless uh, logo, that was one of the earliest ones that RCA used. And in the upper right, that sort of red block letters is one of the last ones they used. So uh, shows some of the evolution of the logos over the years. So in order to understand RCA's history, you really have to uh, understand the history of several other companies that made possible RCA. And the one to start with, of course, is American Marconi. So let's go back to uh, the beginning of the 20th century. And here's a picture of our friend uh, Guillermo Marconi as a young guy. His company was the first really successful company to have long distance wireless telegraphy that really worked well. And uh, you know, remind you all that uh, around 1900, uh, nobody had developed wireless telephony, a uh, voice and music uh, that worked well. So it was strictly wireless telegraphy at the time with Morse code. And when the Marconi company was formed, the business model was to establish communication links with ships at sea and then also uh, transatlantic uh, message uh, communication to compete with the undersea cables. Uh, and Marconi's headquarters, of course, was in, in England, but uh, he established an American su subsidiary, the American Marconi Company, which uh, handled operations here in the United States. So this is a picture of uh, Marconi's big transmitter site at Poldu in Cornwall, southwestern part of England. And this is where the first message was sent across the Atlantic in, in 1901 using, uh, using this particular station. You can see the big antenna mass. Uh, this was very low frequency stuff uh, back in those days. So. And one of the things that really helped the uh, Marconi company was in 1912, the Titanic incident. Of course, the Titanic hit the iceberg and began to sink and it had a Marconi radio system on board. Uh, the picture here is showing you what that would have looked like. And so they were able to call for help and uh, that incident really convinced the world that ships at sea really needed to have radio on board in order to uh, handle any emergencies that might come up. And so Marconi's business uh, grew very, uh, very quickly after the, after the uh, Titanic incident. Uh, this is a picture here of uh, one of the rooms at one of Marconi's big stations. Now, of course, in the early days, the only transmitters they had were spark transmitters, which work quite well for wireless telegraphy, but you couldn't use spark transmitters for uh, voice and music. So uh, leading up to the era before World War I, uh, you had three types of transmitters that were in use for long distance communication. The spark transmitter was the first one. Uh, the second technology was the arc transmitter invented by Valdemar Polson, a Danish guy. But here in the United States, a, a California based company, the federal company uh, developed these big high power arc transmitters. And the one pictured here is a, is a, a half a million watt arc transmitter. And they work pretty well for long distance communication. The Navy used a lot of them. And then the third technology uh, around the time of World War I was the uh, alternator. Uh, this is a picture of one of General Electric's uh, big alternators. Uh, it's basically just not that much difference from the alternator in your car. It's an AC generator driven by a big motor. And uh, the trick was to get these things to work at high frequencies like you know 50 kilohertz uh, range. Uh, and so GE built uh, built a lot of these big high power alternators. They're big and bulky, sort of like something you'd see in an electric power plant. So those are the three technologies that were important back in that era. Now, Marconi had some competition for long distance wireless. And here in the United States, there were uh, some other companies, uh, a German company, uh, a subsidiary of Telefunken had a big station at Sayville, Long Island. Another company, Homag, had one in Tuckerton, New Jersey. Uh, Reginald Fessenden, uh, who is a very important guy in the history of radio, uh, had a station at Brant Rock, Massachusetts. And on the West Coast, Federal Telegraph had established uh, uh, stations um, up and down the West Coast. Here's a picture of Fessenden's crew. Uh, this has had his station at Brant Rock, Massachusetts. Um, and the important thing is his company had some key patents that you needed uh, for long distance communication. Now, the other, uh, other party that was involved in this at the time was the phone company. Uh, AT&T had a lot of uh, very good research work on vacuum tubes. And around 1915, they did as an experiment, a high power vacuum tube transmitter uh, 
at a site at Arlington, Virginia, right about where Reagan National Airport is today. And so they were trying to show that by putting uh, hundreds and hundreds of vacuum tubes in parallel, you could, uh, you could make a high power transmitter. So, so they also had some important technology. Well, when the war started, a lot of things happened. One of the things happened early in the war was some of these undersea cables were cut. And uh, that caused people to realize that if you, if you uh, were in a war situation, somebody cut your cables, uh, about the only thing you had left to depend on was radio, uh, wireless, uh, wireless systems. And so uh, the US Navy uh, decided that uh, radio communication was a critical technology for, uh, for the military. And so when the war started, uh, the US Navy took over control of all the wireless stations in the United States, those domestically owned and those owned by foreign companies, uh, because they, uh, they felt that this, this was such a critical technology. Well, one of the things that happened during the war was the Navy wanted to buy radio equipment and they wanted to get state-of-the-art equipment. And prior to the war, there were patent wars going on. Every company that had patents was suing every other company that had patents. and so. You know, nobody could get anything done because of all this patent litigation. So the Navy said, look, we want the best equipment you can get. Don't worry about patent infringement. Just go ahead and use any patents you want. And if you get sued, the Navy will take care of it. So that meant that there was extremely rapid progress during the war because all of the companies could, could use, uh, you know, all the best technology available. But again, I want to emphasize that at this time, nobody was really thinking about entertainment, or at least most people weren't. Uh, it was really, uh, radio was still thought of as a military technology and as a point-to-point -point communication technology rather than uh, something that would be used for entertainment. Well, as the war was winding down, the Navy had really liked the idea of having control of wireless, and uh, they felt that even in peacetime, the Navy should have complete control of wireless. Uh, they tried to convince Congress of that, but Congress didn't agree, and Congress felt that uh, civilian control of wireless was more appropriate. And there were people like uh, the American Radio Relay League and other hams that uh, went to Congress and lobbied to try to uh, make sure that uh, even ham operators could have access to the airways. So the Navy failed in getting uh, control of wireless, but they still were concerned with making sure that, uh, that the United States uh, was in a good position with regard to uh, radio communication. Well, the Marconi company, uh, at the, as the war was winding down, realized that it needed to upgrade all its stations because it still had a lot of these spark transmitters all around the world. And it realized that in order to be into the latest technology, they needed either arc transmitters or alternator tech, uh, technology. And so they, they first went to the federal company and started negotiating with them about trying to get exclusive use of their arc, of their arc tech uh, transmitters. Um, and the US Navy was uh, worried about that. So the Navy actually went and sort of uh, went around them and, and uh, purchased the rights from federal. And so then, uh, then they thought, well, maybe we could get the alternator technology. So they, they failed with getting the ARC technology because the Navy sort of bought federal out from underneath them. And then they tried to get exclusive rights to GE's alternators. And while this was all going on, the Navy decided they really needed to take some aggressive action. So this is a picture of Admiral Bullard, the director of Naval Communications at the time. And uh, he decided to do something about it. And so he went to visit the upper management of GE and appealed to their patriotism and said to GE, look, uh, the Navy, we've got to have this technology under control of a U.S. company. Uh, why don't you, GE, buy out American Marconi, and that way we'll make sure that we have American control of this. Well, the GE management was sort of sympathetic to this. They had a very good relationship with the Navy and the Army, and so, uh, you know, they didn't want to antagonize the Navy. Uh, and the question is, why would American Marconi be willing to sell a successful company? Well, at the time, uh, they were short of cash. The parent company was short of cash. They needed to expand their wireless stations all over the world, uh, needed some capital for that. And they could see the handwriting on the wall that the US Navy was never going to be very sympathetic to American Marconi. And so they said, well, all right, why don't we just go ahead and uh, sell it to GE? We can uh, get some badly needed cash that way. So. That's what happened. Uh, GE decided to go ahead and, and create a new company. Rather than just make this new uh, thing a part of uh, GE, they decided to establish a separate company. 
And here's a picture of Owen, uh, Owen Young. Uh, he was a, a very important vice president at GE, and he was really the key individual involved in designing RCA and creating this uh, separate new company. So in October 1919, the paperwork was signed and RCA uh, was formed uh, with patent reciprocity. So the GE had access to any patents that RCA got and vice versa. And in order to make a smooth transition, um, RCA hired American Marconi's head, a guy named Edward Nelly, to become RCA's first president and sort of make a smooth transition. Um, that didn't last very long. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, Nelly stepped down and a, an army general, General Harbor, took over. But by having American Marconi's leader uh, uh, take over when RCA started, it was uh, possible to make a very smooth transition. So. The point here is that when RCA was created, it was created as a quasi-government co corporation, somewhat like ComSat in more recent times. Uh, the Navy actually had a representative sitting on RCA's board to make sure that, that everything RCA did would be uh, 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 inconsistent with the Navy's needs. And uh, this fellow, David Sarnoff, who had started off as an office boy and rose up through the ranks of American Marconi, uh, became RCA's commercial manager and, of course, then ended up heading RCA for decades and being a, a critical person in the history of the company. Well, very early on, RCA realized that if they were going to succeed, they needed to have access to not only GE's patents, but patents from some of these other companies that had critical technology. Uh, it was obvious that uh, during the war, this, uh, this patent pooling that the Navy encouraged uh, was something that really made for success. So, so RCA said, let's look around and let's see what other technology we need to have in order to, to succeed in what we're doing. Well, uh, one of the companies was Westinghouse. Westinghouse, of course, was a competitor of GE. Uh, back in that era, Westinghouse and GE were the two largest companies in things like motors and electrical motors and generators and electrical equipment of all kinds. And so because, our, because GE was getting into radio in a big way, uh, Westinghouse decided they needed to get into radio in order to keep up with their, with their competitor. And uh, so they decided they were going to try to get involved in things like transatlantic uh, wireless communication. And they bought a company called International Radio Telegraph in 1920. Uh, one reason they wanted that company is because that company had uh, Fessenden's uh, uh, important patents. Another important company was Wireless Specialty Apparatus, a New England-based company founded in 1907. Um, interesting enough, one of the earliest users of radio was the United Fruit Company, which had banana boats going between Central America and the United States. And uh, United Fruit wanted to have state-of-the-art radio gear, so they had a deal with Wireless Specialty Apparatus to provide equipment. And that was so successful that about 1912, WSA actually became a subsidiary of United Fruit. So <laughs> it's always kind of funny to me that a banana company was one of the uh, leaders in early radio. But uh, WSA had some crystal detector patents that were very important. And of course, in, in 1920 or thereabouts, crystal detectors were still pretty important. And then another company, of course, was AT&T. I'd mentioned that transmitter that they had in 1915. Uh, they were one of the leaders in vacuum tube technology. They had some of the uh, Lee DeForest key patents. Uh, they had uh, done that test I mentioned. And so the Navy, uh, in order to make uh, RCA successful, went around to Westinghouse, to AT&T and WSA and said, we want you to join this new radio group so that we can all share patents and that way RCA can be a success. And uh, so that's what happened. And RCA and AT&T ended up dividing uh, up the business opportunities. So this, uh, this arrangement was often called the radio group. Uh, AT&T joined the party in uh, July 1920, United Fruit in March 21, and Westinghouse in June of 21. And these uh, transactions were very complicated. Money changed hands, stock went back and forth. Uh, when all the dust cleared, RCA now had control of about 2,000 key radio patents. And throughout RCA's existence, uh, patent ownership is one of the most important parts of their business. There were, there were times during the Depression when uh, if it hadn't been for patent royalties, uh, RCA might have, uh, might have been in the red, but uh, they made a lot of money from patent royalties. 
So there were some agreements here. The agreement was that RCA would operate maritime and trans-oceanic uh, communications. Um, even though American Marconi had a small factory in New Jersey that made some equipment, uh, in order to crank out larger quantities of equipment, RCA needed to have manufacturing capability. And so they had to rely on Westinghouse and GE for that. And the agreement eventually worked out that GE would make about 60% of RCA stuff and Westinghouse about 40% uh, during the 20s. And uh, WSA made a few radios, but not very many. It was pretty small. So in order to, uh, to get on board with their uh, transatlantic communication, RCA built a huge facility out on the end of Long Island uh, in about 1921 place called Radio Central, they took over about 10 square miles with huge antennas uh, in order to communicate not only with Europe, but uh, with uh, South America. Here are a couple of pictures. The top picture is the receiving station. The bottom is the transmitter. Uh, and because they didn't want to have the receivers right next to the high power transmitters, they separated the stations by several miles. And so, as I say, the top one is where they had all the receivers and the bottom one is where they had uh, uh, their transmitters. And of course, they used uh, telephone links uh, between Long Island and the RCA headquarters in, in uh, downtown New York. So Radio Central was important, not only for the communication part of it, but uh, they did a lot of important research on antenna designs. Uh, they did work, actually later did work on FM there and, uh, you know, special receiver. Uh, so that it was actually kind of a research laboratory in some ways. But the sad thing is after they spent all this money uh, putting in these big, huge alternators and these huge antennas, uh, the technology progressed very rapidly and pretty soon shortwave uh, tube transmitters and small antennas began to take over. And so uh, it wasn't too long before all the original equipment became obsolete. So by the 1930s, uh, uh, RCA was really doing a great job of uh, worldwide communication. You can see the picture here that shows all the links to Europe and Africa and South America. And RCA also built uh, transmitter sites in the West Coast, a community with Japan and Australia and New Zealand. So um, if you go back to the 1930s, there were some exciting things that happened uh, thanks to RCA. Uh, when Admiral Byrd had his expeditions in Antarctica, they were actually uh, uh, having live broadcast to American consumers from Antarctica, which uh, you know were received by that uh, that receiving station on Long Island. And during World War II in the 1940s, uh, if you were listening to Edward R. Murrow or other commentators from Europe, uh, that was most likely coming through the uh, RCA stations on Long Island. Well, now we need to talk about entertainment radio. I, I mentioned earlier how the, uh, the earliest days of RCA were uh, strictly a, sort of a point-to-point -point communication system, but there were people long ago thinking about entertainment. This fellow, Charles Harold in San Jose, California, had a vocational school to train radio operators. In about 1909, he, uh, he provided his students with some, probably some crystal radios that they could take home, and he would play phonograph records from his... Uh, from his uh, station uh, at, the, uh, at the school. So that was an early example of what you might call entertainment. Uh, Lee DeForest broadcast the Metropolitan Opera in New York around 1910, but uh, of course there were only a handful of people who had receivers, but uh, he was one of these people who said that someday people will probably have radios in their living rooms to get music in their homes. There were a few ham radio operators prior to World War II who were broadcasting voice and music. Uh, it's a picture of uh, Westinghouse's Frank Conrad, who started KDKA, and he had been broadcasting phonograph records from his ham station at home, and that was one of the things that convinced Westinghouse to start building uh, entertainment radios and to start up KDKA. So uh, prior to the war, there were at least a, a few pioneers who were showing that it was possible for people to have uh, radio entertainment in their homes. So uh, KDKA was launched in November 1920. And the important thing is that KDKA came on before Westinghouse joined RCA. And before Westinghouse joined RCA, they were making uh, radio receivers uh, with their own Westinghouse uh, labels on them. So by 1922, uh, entertainment was really beginning to catch on. Uh, Washington, D.C. got its first radio stations in 1922, and uh, sales of home radio receivers began to soar. And RCA 
even though it was formed as a uh, international and maritime communications company, decided they needed to get into consumer electronics. And David Sarnoff was one of the uh, company managers who was pushing the company to do that, even though some of the old guard uh, uh, RCA people were sort of skeptical about whether it made sense to get into entertainment radio. So in 1922, RCA starts uh, into this entertainment radio business. This is a famous book that's been reprinted that you uh, see at our antique radio meets a lot. Uh, and what happened was, uh, because RCA didn't have factories of its own, it was selling radios made by Westinghouse, GE, and wireless specialty apparatus. RCA began establishing some radio stations of its own in 1921, WDY, WJZ, WBZ. Uh, with, well, Westinghouse was WJZ and WBZ. Um, so uh, not long after it started, RCA began to exercise its patent rights. And uh, so if people were infringing on RCA's patents, they began to uh, start with lawsuits. And not too long into the 20s, monopoly complaints began to mount. Uh, people were saying that RCA is becoming a monopoly. But RCA during the 20s was extremely successful. At the beginning of that era, they had about 500 employees. And uh, as you get into the 1930s, they had like 22,000 employees over a period of years. So uh, RCA stock price soared during the 20s. It was one of the, the best stocks to buy dur during, during that era. And then in 1926, there were some changes made. Uh, AT&T uh, sort of separated out and decided not to get into radio broadcasting, although they continued to make transmitters and, and other types of radio equipment. And then of course, that was when uh, networks got started, when RCA got started. I'm sorry, when, uh, when NBC got started by RCA. So here's, a, here's an early ad from RCA uh, for a crystal radio model ER753. And if you look at this ad carefully, you'll notice that that radio still has a GE logo on top of it. So it was a GE mail built radio marketed by RCA. And uh, within a short period of time, things that have been made with the Westinghouse uh, name on them begin to switch over to having the RCA name. So here's a good example of the, on the left, the Westinghouse Ariola Senior, and on the right, the RCA Radiola Senior. It's the same radio, but uh, just changing from Westinghouse brand to RCA brand. Now, in the 1920s, RCA made some very expensive radios. Uh, this is the Radiola 30 from 1925. Uh, in today's dollars, that would be worth almost $8,000. So um, RCA did not really go after the, the low price market like Crosley did. RCA tended to make more expensive radios. And of course, RCA owned the Super Heterodyne patents, uh, which uh, Armstrong Super Heterodyne patents. And, that was another uh, complaint that some of the smaller companies made is that during the 20s, RCA was unwilling to license other companies to make super heads. So some important developments is that uh, before long, consumer radios became a more important part of RCA's business than the international communications for which it had been founded. Uh, I mentioned the formation of RCA, which turned out to be a very successful business. But by the late 20s, uh, the Federal Communicate or the Federal Trade Commission was uh, beginning to uh, bear down on RCA and uh, its rivals were uh, calling out the trust busters to do something about particularly trying to put pressure on RCA to be willing to license their patents to other companies. Another development was that uh, Sarnoff was, was sick and tired of having to depend on GE and Westinghouse to manufacture his radios because it took too long to make decisions and he wanted to have, he wanted to have factories of his own. And so it was kind of like uh, when Br'er Rabbit said, don't throw me in the briar patch, uh, David Sarnoff uh, sort of went along with the federal government and sort of was agreeing to have the split between GE and Westinghouse and RCA, which uh, would get the trust busters off of his back, but would also allow uh, him to have his own factories. And so what happened was uh, on January 1st, 1930, the Victor Company became part of RCA. It became RCA Victor. And now RCA had a big factory and also took over uh, the His Master's Voice logo from Victor, which of course was a, a hugely successful phonograph company. So GE and Westinghouse sort of got a divorce and uh, they were uh, prohibited from making radios for a couple of years, but by the mid 1930s, GE and Westinghouse were allowed to make radios and sell them on their own separate from RCA. 
Well, uh, as I said, RCA got huge factory buildings. Uh, Victor's uh, footprint in Camden, New Jersey was uh, multiple uh, big factory buildings. So now RCA had plenty of space to make any radios they wanted to. And the patent royalties rolled in. Uh, they built Radio City in New York City. Uh, Radio City had uh, wonderful uh, studios. Uh, uh, and during the 20, or during the 30s, uh, Philco was the sales leader most of the time, but RSA was pretty high uh, at, uh, in terms of uh, dollar income. And during the 30s, uh, Sarnoff felt that television was the next biggest breakthrough. And so his emphasis was on television research uh, and poured a lot of money into TV. RCA began to branch out into other businesses, electronic businesses, uh, things like public address systems. Um, they teamed up with the Keith Orff, the um, vaudeville theater chain, and uh, came up with a new company called RKL Pictures, which owned movie theaters and uh, started making movies. Uh, RCA had a division called the Photophone, uh, which was making movie projectors and sound systems to compete with Western Electric's movie business called Vitaphone. Uh, around 1930, they had a separate part of the company set up called the Radiotron Companies, uh, just for tube production. And uh, RCA bought what was left of DeForest during that era. So with regard to television, uh, Vladimir Zorkin was a very important research of Westinghouse, uh, got some important patents on things like uh, camera tubes, iconoscopes. And uh, Westinghouse had not really had that much interest in television. So in 1930, uh, when they took, when RCA took over the Victor Company, uh, Zorkin and some of his engineers moved to Camden and began working on television research for, for RCA. And uh, throughout the 1930s, RCA poured money into it. Uh, the board of directors was coming down hard on Sarnoff for not getting any return on investment. But in the end, of course, RCA made a huge amount of money on television. Uh, in 1939, at the World's Fair, David Sarnoff launched regular TV broadcasting uh, on an experimental basis. And then in 1941, uh, the stations were allowed to have commercials. Well, during World War II, of course, RCA and all of the other electronics companies shut down uh, commercial uh, civilian production and switched all of their emphasis to uh, producing military electronics. Uh, and in the late 1940s, uh, television was what RCA was putting most of its attention on and particularly trying to develop a color system. Although after World War II, RCA continued to be a big player in military electronics with things like radar and military communications. Uh, in 1950, RCA came out with their new 45 RPM record system and record players and most of the radios had phono jacks so you could plug in one of these uh, R uh, 45 RPM players. Uh, David Sarnoff really believed in research, and uh, so here is the RCA Research Lab at Princeton, New Jersey, which opened about 1941. Uh, it was later called the Sarnoff Research Center, and then when RCA went down the tubes, uh, the Stanford Research Institute bought it. Uh, for a while, it was called the Sarnoff Corporation. Well, in the 1950s, uh, RCA succeeded with their color TV system. Uh, their competitor, CBS Columbia, had tried to come up with a a kludgy system involving rotating color filters, which was incompatible with the black and white TV. But uh, eventually RCA won that battle and uh, certainly did well making uh, color TV sets and uh, got into transistor radios. Not the first certainly, but uh, got into transistor radios. Uh, this picture on the left is an RCA CT100. That's their first color set in 1954. Cost $1,000 initially, which is awfully expensive. Uh, they built a big factory in Indianapolis to crank out television sets. Here's a, a picture of their Indianapolis factory. And in the 1950s, they got into home appliances. So you may remember in those days, we had RCA Whirlpool appliances, uh, stoves, refrigerators. And uh, they, uh, they made a lot of transistor radios during that era too. Well, in 1965, David Sarnoff retired and his son, Robert, took over. Uh, Unfortunately, his son Robert was not the great executive that Sar David Sarnoff was, and no sooner than did the son take over that the company began to go downhill. It may not have been all Sar Robert Sarnoff's fault, but I, I, I think that chances are David Sarnoff would have done better than his son did. For one thing, uh, David Sarnoff really loved radio. He, uh, you know, 
he had started out as a uh, as a telegrapher, a radio telegrapher with wire, with uh, American Marconi, and was really interested in all the details of electronics. Where his son Robert was just more of a business kind of a guy. RCA got into the mainstream mainframe computer business. Uh, they tried to compete with IBM. Uh, and even though RCA did make a, and sell a few large computers, uh, that was a business failure and went out of business about the early 70s. And they uh, tried making, uh, oops, they tried making video discs, but that didn't work. Uh, I remember very distinctly in the 1970s, uh, I picked up the morning paper one day and read that uh, Sar Robert Sarnoff had decided to diversify and they, uh, RCA bought Hertz Rental Car, Banquet Frozen Foods, Gibson greeting cards and some other companies. And I turned to my wife and said, that's gonna be the death of RCA. They're gonna get spread so thin with all these other businesses that have nothing to do with electronics. You can't possibly run a company in so many different fields and have it be successful. And of course, that's exactly what happened. They went down the tubes. And then the other thing, of course, was in that era, the Japanese were really coming on strong. Companies like Sony and Panasonic were cranking out really good quality equipment, uh, very reasonable prices. And so American manufacturers had more and more trouble competing. And uh, because labor costs were cheaper in Asia, radio manufacturing began to shift to Asia, although a lot of TV sets uh, were still made at RCA's plant in Indianapolis. All right, so uh, by 1985, RCA was on the skids, everything was going to pop. History repeated itself and uh, turned around. RCA, uh, or G GE bought RCA in 1985 and began to sell off parts of the company. The consumer products line soon went to Thompson, a French company. Uh, GE kept NBC television, but sold the radio network to Westwood One and uh, NBC eventually went to Comcast. Today, if you go to a store, you might see an RCA television set. Uh, they're made in Asia by some company called On. You can buy a telephone that says RCA on it from a company called Telefield. Uh, if you see an RCA uh, recording, it's uh, part of Sony nowadays. And there's microwave equipment that said RCA on it from a company called Curtis. So even though the RCA name is still around, it has no connection, whatever, really, with the original RCA company. So in winding up, uh, RCA fell apart. At one time, in my opinion, it was the world's premier electronics company uh, built almost single-handedly by David Sarnoff, who a lot of people didn't like him. He, was, he had a huge ego, he was ruthless uh, and all of that, but you have to give him credit. He certainly built a successful company. It's fascinating that it started out as a quasi-government corporation for international communications, but quickly changed into a consumer electronics company. Throughout much of its life, it was criticized for being a monopoly, but in the, in the end, it certainly made very important uh, contributions to TV, military, satellite communications, things like electron microscopes, test equipment, and much more. So I think we have to uh, give a lot of credit for a company that uh, certainly accomplished a lot. And I'll end with this last slide. I'm a volunteer at this museum in Bowie, Maryland called the National Capital Radio and Television Museum. Uh, if any of you from the club are going to be in the Washington area and want to visit, uh, if you're here on a day when we're not open to the public, uh, give me a few days warning and I can probably make a special opening to show you around. And uh, you, might, uh, you might even want to consider become a member for 25 bucks a year. You can become a member of the museum and it's a uh, we publish a very nice quarterly journal with articles about radio and TV history. So I will quit at this point and I will do my best to uh, try to answer any questions if I can. Thank you, Brian. That was uh, awesome. I see a lot of people applauding. Here. That's, uh, that's uh, certainly deservedly so. You covered a tremendous amount of ground there. And uh, boy, you filled in all the details very, very finely. Uh, does anyone have questions uh, for Brian about the history of RCA? I've got one. Um, back in the early days, what was the difference to, between ARC and SPARC transmitters? I mean, I, I understand perhaps they may be uh, the way they were generated. Could you fill, fill us in on that? Well, I'm not really an expert at either one. Of course, you know, with, with a spark transmitter, you have a spark discharge 
And uh, originally it was just a simple spark discharge, but then they came up with things like rotary spark generators that uh, would sort of continuously have one spark after another. Um, and the arc transmitter was sort of like, you might call it a continuous spark. It was a you know continuous arc between two electrodes and you needed a huge magnetic field for that. Um, so there were some similarities, but they, they really were different in, in the way that they, uh, they operated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting, yeah. Interestingly enough, um, uh, people say, "Well, when was when was frequency modulation invented?" Well, a lot of those a lot of those um, arc transmitters actually used uh, frequency shift keying, where instead of you know turning the turning the thing on and off, you'd keep the arc running, but you'd have a uh, tuned circuit, and when you press the key, it would uh, it would change the, the the resonant frequency of the circuit. So you would be switching from one frequency to another to get the dots and dashes. And so you could say it was kind of an early effort at frequency modulation. Yeah, F FSK. Huh? Yep. Oh, That's cool. About uh, how far is that museum from Newington, Connecticut? Any ideas? It's quite a ways. Uh, the The museum that I'm associated with is uh, just outside the Beltway, outside of Washington, D.C. It's probably, well, if there were no traffic, it'd be about a half an hour drive from downtown D.C. Of course, there's always traffic. So. <laughs> it's between Washington, D.C. and Annapolis, Maryland. Okay. That's that's the uh, what the naval base there. I'm sorry, what one? That's where the naval base is at. Well, the uh, Annapolis uh, Naval Academy is in Annapolis, so we're not too far away from that. It's uh, the museum is just a few miles outside of the Beltway. Okay, thank you, Brian. I've got to ask, how long did you research to put together that comprehensive? summary. <laughs> well, I didn't have to do that much research because other people have done wonderful research. And here's, I don't know if you can see this, mm -hmm. uh, Eric Wenis has written this book called uh, Radiola. And I really urge you, if you don't have a copy of this, get a copy of this book. It's absolutely fabulous. Uh, it tells the story of uh, RCA very, very well. And there are a couple of biographies of Sarnoff uh, that are available. Um, and there's a, no, a number of other books about radio history, you know, that have chapters about RCA. So there's plenty of information out there. You just have to, you know, pick up the books and get it from there. So I didn't have to do any of the research myself. Well done. Well done. That's all I can say. It's a very awesome and thorough presentation, uh, Brian. Thank you very much. And thank you for the generous offer of uh, anyone who wants to come visit your museum. That's, that's very nice. Yeah, thank you, Brian. That was good. All right. Any other questions for Brian? All right. Well, I thank you again, Brian. And our next presenter uh, is uh, going to fill us in on part three of his ongoing series of presentations on uh, Briggs and Stratton radio equipment. So I'll welcome Dale Boyce to the presenter's forefront here, so go for it. Thank you, Tom. Thanks again for uh, inviting me to, to uh, do this. And now this is part three of the Briggs and Stratton radios information. And this is the results of my uh, ongoing search for Briggs and Stratton radio stuff. And a couple of things that uh, dug up are, that are related is the, uh, the Grunel uh, Shirley Temple Teledial Radio and the Arcturus Radio Tube Company is, have connections to Briggs and Stratton. So as you already know, I collect and research radios and related information that concerns Briggs and Stratton from Milwaukee here. Uh, Part one covered the 1922 crystal radio and their battery radio components, which they sold all over the country. Part two was the battery eliminators from 1927 and thereafter. Uh, most tuned radio frequency TRF radios from the 20s had 
lots of knobs and switches and could be confusing to consumers. And a major development in the mid twenties was a, uh, a myriad of single dial mechanisms to simplify tuning radios. And let me see if I can minimize the screen over here. There. Uh, there's a book uh, behind the front panel by David Rutland. That's a interesting read. And it references a 1979 book by Harrison called Single Controlled Tuning. Uh, between 1924 and 27, when basically the battery sets were kind of winding down, uh, the number of patents for single control mechanisms for TRF radios increased from less than 10 to over 100. Then came radios with the super head circuits, more tubes, but they were simpler to tune. And they operated on household power so that messing batteries weren't needed. Uh, let's, where did this go? Uh, between 1910 and 1985, Briggs and Stratton was granted over 635 patents. Most of those were engine related, but there were a lot of them related to their radio products. Um, according to the legend of Briggs and Stratton and other company history publications, in the mid thirties, Basco developed a push button station selection radio tuning device that could be attached to any single dial radio to accomplish tuning. It appears to have been developed for an unidentified third party since it, none of the information I have found says who they made it for. So I did patent searches and from a recent patent search, I believe I found such a radio tuning dial device. Patent number US2251612A. It was invented by Eric Eugene Coles and Glenn Thompson from Ferry Chasm, Wisconsin. It's not a fictitious name. Ferry Chasm is a street name in a suburb just north of Milwaukee. The patent application was filed February 16th, 1938, which is when it was assigned to Briggs and Stratton. The patent wasn't granted until August 5th, 1941. I don't know how long it took these industrial designers to invent the dial. Their names do appear on other inventions. From the patent descriptions and diagrams, I recognize the familiar radio dial. We have a Grunel Model 1291 Teledial 12 console radio. The Teledial 12 was introduced August of 1936, according to the radio retailing advertisement on page 97 of the book Flick of the Switch by Morgan McMahon. It's a 12 tube multi-band radio. It's a nice big console. <clears throat> teledial is an abbreviation for telephone dial. For those who may not be familiar with the rotary dial telephones, they were the analog rotary mechanical electrical index device, which prevented user interface with telephones from the 1890s through the 1960s, when digital push button touch tone dials became the norm. Next image is of uh, some rotary telephone dials followed by some of the patent information. So for those that are only into digital phone, and these came before. <clears throat> the small one is a uh, uh, 1947. Then we have a couple, one is 1961 and one is 1967. They're fairly easy to date because Western Electric stamped the month and a year on the, on the back of these. And of course they showed up in everything from your desktop phones to pay phones and a variety of other devices. Here's a couple pages of patent information on this 2251612. The uh, tuning dial is what I finally found it under. Here's Coles and Thompson from Ferry Chasm. And you can see it was assigned to Briggs and Stratton in 1938. Here's another uh, 
page from the patent information. The top diagram is a cross section through the, uh, the lower image is the front dial, the front of the escutcheon. The escutcheon shows up as this line on the, in the top one. And by punching the dials, by punching an individual button on the dial and rotating the dial, just like a telephone dial, you would tune into a preset station. This one has 15 preset stations. For fine tuning, there's a knob on the right side that you can rotate and that's got dial cord connection to the internals to uh, accomplish fine tuning or to get to a station that's not preset. Here's a picture of the, uh, the dial. Here's the, the tuning knob. But again, this uh, push button tuning was, was pretty neat. It's a uh, multi-band and when you turn it on, it lights up and it's multicolors coming through. This is the radio retailing uh, ad from 1936 showing Shirley Temple. She, of course, was the popular child actress who was photographed with the radio by uh, Gruno. Uh, now, from the 1936 ad and comparing that with the patent information, it appears that the radios were made and marketed before the patent was filed or awarded. The 10 and a half inch diameter metal escutcheon has 15 5 eighths inch diameter holes for the preset push buttons. It's secured to the chassis with six machine screws. And a novel thing about this dial, another novel thing is presetting the station push buttons can be done from the front with a screwdriver without removing the chassis from the cabinet or taking it to a repair shop. Bruno uh, made several teledial models according to reference books and catalogs and, uh, and websites. In addition to the model 1291, which shows on the right in the next image, we have a Bruno 1181, which is shown on the left. Sitting on top of the left one is a Bakelite airline Montgomery Ward's teledial radio, model 62476. Its dial is only three inches in diameter. The series of Radiomania books by Mark Stein show dozens of radios with rotary telephone-like tuning. Uh, I'll also refer you to worldradiohistory.com, the website for access to over 4 million pages of digitized radio information. I thank Tom Zazak for that reference. So on the right side, on the lower here is the 1291 teledial. Next to it on the left side is a 1181 teledial. Uh, and the little Montgomery Wards airline set on top. I might mention that the Iowa Antique Radio Club auction in late August had at least six of the airline versions of uh, teledial radios from tabletops to consoles. Here's a close up of the 62476 uh, teledial. The MW is a, is a logo for Montgomery Wards. Now, according to published corporation history in 1937, the licensing rights for the radio tuning device were sold by Briggs and Stratton to Arcturus Radio Tube Company from New Jersey for a royalty of seven and a half cents per unit and $10,000 per year. That information shows up in several different histories that I've found on Briggs and Stratton. I do not know the relationship between Briggs and Stratton and Gruno, or between Gruno and Arcturus. Those are topics for future research. It appears to me that Briggs and Stratton successfully developed their patent to a point where Briggs and Stratton and Gruno developed the product, manufactured it, and marketed it on their teledial series of radios. Only then did the radio tuning dial device patent licensing rights 
were sold to Arcturus. And I don't know what Arcturus did with their purchase of these licensing rights or how many years the royalties may have been paid. The telephone type dial radios were also made by other companies in addition to Bruno and Montgomery Wards. They made consoles and tabletop models. Uh, perhaps Arcturus licensed all of these manufacturers. The teledial style radios were available at AC, DC battery farm sets. The uh, console airline one I have from uh, Montgomery Wards is a three volt console set that operates on six tubes. And the battery adjustment voltage with a new battery, it goes from three volts. And when the battery is getting worn down, it, there's an adjustment to turn it down to two volts. And I speculate that there was collaboration between Briggs and Stratton, the, their design folks in the Milwaukee East plant who worked on the 1920s airline radios, which along with the Briggs radios and Globe radios and the uh, other manufacturers, they were made in the Milwaukee East plant. And I suspect there may be a, some connection between those people that worked on the airline radios and the teledial type radios that were manufactured in the 1930s. That East plant that Briggs had was an incubator for design and manufacturing of uh, their engines and motors and all sorts of other stuff, as well as radio equipment, starting in 1917 until they got out of the radios in 37, but uh, it didn't, uh, the plant was there until 1973. It was uh, highlighted in this 19. 22 radio dealer full page advertisement. So we're gonna shift a little bit here and move on to Arcturus. Reason Stratton did not develop or manufacture radio tubes that I know of. So this is the end of the Briggs part and we'll move on to some collectible radio tubes. Most radio collectors know of Arcturus from their blue glass radio tubes and many types and variations. Some of the images of blue glass tubes follow. Here's an assortment of blue tubes in a display case that I made. They vary from the uh, UV99 in the upper left to uh, the 45s and the type 80s. And there's a bunch more of them that are around. Here's a different image. Uh, I've got several of the, the tubes and boxes that are not in display cases yet. They're projects in, in transit. Here's another, a box of blue tubes waiting to be cataloged and organized. They made dozens of radio tubes under their label and for other companies, including Crosley, Sonora, Wonderlich. Cardin, a division with Spartan. And these blue tubes are collectible. In addition to blue tubes, the red, gold, green glass, and painted radio tubes made by others are collectible. Brights and blue, to name one, made and sold sequentially numbered tubes in box sets as a one through nine with certificates. Uh, other colored glass tubes names include Sonora, they made blue, uh, JRJ out of Illinois made blue. Sonatron made red, white, and blue tubes in the T14 and T8 sizes. Airline made the gold tubes, and Music Master also made gold tubes. Uh, QRS Music Company, famous for player pianos and piano music rolls, made painted red top radio tubes and specialty tubes for other companies. Those are topics for future presentations. Going back to the part one presentation, this is a picture of my Briggs and Stratton crystal radio type 7030. It's now 99 years old and it's a key part in my collection.
And on to the thank yous. I want to thank my wife, Chris, my collecting partner for 38 interesting years. I want to thank the ARCI Zoom team for all their help, the Warkey and Arky members, radio friends nearby and around the world, family and radio friends who are no longer with us. I miss you every day. For additional information, you can refer to the Basco articles and Warkey News July and September of 2013, Radio Age of October 2013 and 2014, and then the ARCI Zoom meeting from May 15th and 26, June 26th, 2021. You can find those when you go to the ARCI YouTube channel. My thanks also to all the editors past and present at Warkey, Mark, and ARCI, especially Chris, Jean Ann, and Greg. Are there any questions? Yeah, I have one. <clears throat> Did you make those uh, tube uh, cabinets? Yes, yes, I made a whole bunch of them. Uh, very good job. It's a box with pegboard, and then I've got uh, a little spacer uh, machine bolts um, where I have those bolted to the background. So, Good uh, job. The plastic panels in front fit in grooves that I saw it out before I assembled them. So thank you, Rudy. Dale, I have a, a observation that uh, I think uh, some of the early 15 volt filament AC tubes that Arcturus made had carbon filament. Could you uh, comment on that? Uh, no, I, I don't know. Uh, it's very possible. I've got, I've got information on Arcturus around, but that'll take a little digging. Uh, and they, they made a lot of different stuff, so it would not surprise me if they had, if there's carbon filaments in there. Good question. Well, Dale, thank you uh, so very much for the this fine presentation. I'm, I'm a little disappointed there aren't any pictures of wildlife. I was expecting that after <laughs> the, the trend from the first two presentations. But well, seriously though, you did an excellent job there in, in tying Briggs and Stratton to Shirley Temple and Blue Arcturus suits. <laughs> now, whenever I see you know some Shirley Temple memorabilia, I will be able to tie that to Briggs and Stratton. Yeah, and those telephone dials that are just, there's a whole lot of them out there. So. Yeah, and and also for pointing out that there's a fairy chasm up <laughs> north of Milwaukee. That's uh, that's kind of an interesting observation there. Well, that name also appears in the Wisconsin Dells, but that's, a, that's not related to these guys, so. Um, and, I, and I see you kind of left a little teaser out there dangling that you're going to do a presentation on tubes uh, in the future and maybe you could weave in the carbon filament part that uh, that Robert just brought up. Yeah, that will, that I can do, I can look that up and see what I can find out. Uh, thank you again for all your help. The, humming bird, the hummingbirds just didn't cooperate, I don't have good pictures of them. So. <laughs> Well, that's, that's great. And uh, any other questions for uh, Dale? Okay, maybe uh, we could stop sharing your screen. And uh, so that, that concludes the uh, portion of our agenda uh, dedicated to presentations. And from the poll that we put out earlier, it, it didn't look like uh, there were any show and tells, although some people did join in a little bit later. Um, I I have a show and tell, so I can fill fill the void if if no one has a uh, a show and tell for this portion. But what we do after the the presentation section is we always put out a poll to you all to see if you're interested in being a presenter and I really encourage you to be a presenter and uh, 
you know, maybe the way to start out is if uh, if you don't feel like you have enough material for a 10 or 15 minute presentation, just do a show and tell and uh, be a participant. So um, please respond to the poll and we'll see if we can get you on as a presenter. We'd love to, to do that. Last weekend was the Ravenswood Manor uh, community garage sale. Uh, Ravenswood Manor is a uh, neighborhood in Chicago. It's about half mile in each direction. And once a year, they do this massive uh, garage sale. And uh, I went over there with my family um, and picked up a couple of batteries. Uh, there weren't, I didn't see any unrestored radios. There were several restored radios, but I'm more interested in the unrestored stuff. Um, now I've got the 67 and a half volt battery i've had it for a while uh very common you know for uh battery radios on the left the 467 but i got this new set over here on the right and um it's a different configuration but uh of a 67 and a half volt battery that i had never seen before and it came uh together with uh, the one, these two one and a half volt A cells and this uh, 67 and a half volt B cell uh, for B plus. Um, so well, I just I thought, think... I just thought that was neat. Uh, I, I know that the, uh, these other cells, uh, I'm sorry, that uh, the 467s here use 45, um, one and a half volt uh, zinc cells. Uh, and I, I just don't know anything about these other ones. I just thought I'd show that. Yeah, well, the, the 467 is, uh, was the uh, battery developed for use in RCA's uh, BP-10 portable yep. from 1940. And the later, the 477, shows up uh, in post-war radios. Uh, uh, I've got a, an Emerson uh, uh, radio using sub-miniature tubes that uses that. Those, uh, those uh, 21R batteries, I think, are actually a, a size F, like in Frank, uh, battery, which is more like one and a half D cells, and uh, they, of course, for uh, filament batteries or, or, as they say, radio A batteries. Thank you. I knew you would know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Matt. Just by coincidence, I happen to have that same. Uh, ah, this is a number four seventy nine. It's a ninety volt. In same style, though, same probably yeah. same cells, just a bigger stack. Right. Then I've got this one here, like your other one. This is a number 276, and it's a 9-volt. It's actually got a, written on the side here, a date of August 5th, 1961. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was surprised that the A cells uh, actually had some voltage on them. Probably no current. It's probably more like a capacitor than a battery. But <laughs> yeah, uh, if this one's bulging pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's my show and tell. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Matt. Is there anyone else that has a show and tell? If not, I have one I'd like to... Bill Michaels has got one. Bill. Okay, yeah. Uh, my neighbor's having a garage sale, and he has this console uh, Motorola radio phonograph for sale, and there's also a separate speaker, console speaker, and he's willing to almost take any price he's wants to get it out of his garage. Uh, 
if anybody's interested, I live in North Lake, Illinois. He lives on Medill. Uh, I think it's around two, about 252 East Medill. He's got some cones set up on the edge of his driveway. There's uh, North Lake is having a citywide garage sale today. So uh, a lot of people I have stuff out there and I thought this might be of interest to somebody. Okay, well, you could, if you put your contact information in the chat window, Bill, then uh, people can get a hold of you. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? If not, I'm going to um, show this a couple of meetings ago. I, I took this radio and showed you the slides of restoring it. And uh, we went through all these photos. I finally found some grill cloth. So uh, there it is right before the grill cloth went in. And there's the grill cloth. I finally got some grill cloth. And so this Crosley uh, wooden table radio is now restored and in my collection. So I thought I'd, I would show that one. And then um, what I have here is a, a series of pictures about a true tone that uh, my brother found in an antique store. And he said, hey, you, you want this? And he sent me a picture. And I said, oh, yeah, I guess so. And uh, I, mean, I like wooden radios, but, you know, I. And I do like to restore them, but this looked like a job. And, and I, I must say the color choice is, was kind of interesting. But um, you can see that the prior owner didn't really pay much attention to you know, detail. And they just kind of painted the red on there. And it was kind of sloppy. And uh, uh, at the bottom of it, there was a rubber stamp and this was also rubber stamped on the chassis that this Tim Ferguson radio shop in Evansville, Indiana uh, had, had touched this somewhere along the way. I, I wouldn't say that they were the ones who painted it, but they, uh, they worked on it. So I had to get this blue paint off and the red paint, obviously, to see what was underneath. And um, so instead of uh, diving in with chemical strippers right off the bat, I used heat. And so if, if, you, uh, if you have another person in your household that has a clothes iron, uh, don't borrow theirs, okay? Use your own. And uh, that's just a piece of helpful advice for domestic tranquility. But with some heat, and a scraper, I was able to get a lot of the blue paint off. And uh, then I went and applied some stripper and you can see it, it curdled this stuff off pretty good. And I think in the, in the same motion, it took whatever lacquer was on there. So those two little techniques, I got everything off the wood and then uh, the side of the case needed to be glued so I kind of pulled the whole thing off and then re-glued it. And then the case was ready for refinishing. So then I looked at the chassis. It was in pretty good shape. It was very uh, dusty. And, um, and here it is. Um, I put it into my radio cradle. And I also took some brass screen and covered the speaker. Because even with a cradle, I have a tendency to reach behind the radio put my finger through this speaker so um, I did that and then uh, I, you know, I brought it up slowly and very and I let the smoke out of this resistor right here and uh, it turned out that this this capacitor was a dead short and, uh, and this is a plate resistor and it, it uh, had to pass a little bit too much current but it wasn't like a catastrophic thing it was very subtle and made made my workshop smell kind of funky for a while. And here it is after recapping. And then here's the, uh, 
the dial, and it's it's this is the front view and the back view, and you can see that the, the pilot light had kind of faded the red color, and uh, I I didn't want to try to restore this. I figured I'd screw it up, so I just left it the way it was, and it still looks pretty cool when the pilot light's on. But it is a very nice uh, logo and design in the middle, very pretty. And then here it is after refinishing and after me breaking the dial glass um, and before I found the, the grow cloth I needed. But, and you can see that the speaker was in excellent shape. I was missing a little dust cover. I had to put some felt on there to do that. And I had to go to eBay and find myself a new dial glass. But uh, yeah, I, did, I, was, I took the dial glass off and I managed to clean it very nice and I put it back in and I didn't bend the little metal tabs in far enough and it managed to fall out and it fell on the floor and cracked in only two pieces. So good news is it wasn't a hundred pieces, but I still had to go find a new one. And then here's the inside of the radio. I finally found the, the, uh, the grow cloth and I made a new cardboard form and then I, my staple gun had staples that were a little too long. So I, I used these other cardboard shims to attach that in, and there it is. I, I uh, finished it and took a picture of it outside. Looks a little bit more red than it really is because of, of the sun, I think. But uh, there's the before and after. So those of you who like to paint radios blue and red, I may have offended you, but I don't like them that way. So that's why it ended up the way it is today. So thanks. Excellent work, Tom. I had a Philco Model 610, a big bullet that was painted all white with white latex house paint. It was just gobbed on there good and thick, and so I can relate to what you had to go through there. Uh, <laughs> quick, know, question. I, uh, quick question. When you went looking on eBay for the glass, uh, when you're trying to search something like that, do you use just like general dimensions, or do you look for by specific, I'm looking for a thing for a Crosley or a True Tone. How do you do your search when you have to find a part like that? Well, in this particular case, you know, you have to have the dimensions and uh, it was kind of an odd dimension, as I recall. And I had to look for a bunch of, I just had to look for a dial glass for an old radio. And you know, eBay's pretty good about throwing stuff at you. And uh, there were all kinds of clock faces that, are out there uh, you know, from, from clocks and watches. And I found one about the right size and it actually was, you know, like about a millimeter too big. So I, uh, I had a grinder and I actually ground off a little bit. Uh, I have a grinder that I use with working with stained glass and it, I was able to grind off the periphery. So it was a, it's a lot of work for having to crack the thing in the first place. But um, I, to, my recommendation is just start searching and you might find it. But in this case, you're not going to find one for that model. You might get lucky and somebody will have a chassis. So, so Tom, that uh, uh, crack that you had in the, uh, in the original Dial, was that a nice clean crack uh, or, or did pieces fall out of it? Well, near the edges, so there were some chips along the crack, but in the middle, it was clean. Because uh, I haven't uh, had to deal with that in recent times, but now I see the advertisements uh, for this. I think one brand is Bondic, B-O-N-D-I-C, mm. UV Cure Adhesive. And, and I'm looking, I, I would like to have a good excuse to try to use that <laughs> on, uh, on patching a, uh, uh, a nice clean crack. And mm. uh, does it, has anybody given that, a, a, a try, tried one of these UV cure uh, adhesives to, uh, to, to uh, fix a cracked lens? Well, I hear a chorus of silence here, so. <laughs> I've, I've used the UV cure adhesive, but never to try to fix glass. Yeah, I, I've, I've been using it for the last year and a half on various things. And 
and it's great on selected uh, uh, problems. Uh, the The main thing when you start seeing uh, advertisements for uh, adhesives is that the, the, they want to tell you that it's a miracle cure for everything. Well, no, uh, it's uh, it can be great for the right application. So there you go. I would still think using that uh, that uh, that adhesive that you're still going to see a line in there just due to the uh, parallax action going on with the uh, actual crack. Well, I've I've heard uh, that uh, that they use a, they use the UV cure adhesives in building up uh, lens stacks for cameras, and, and uh, so. Mm. You, uh, there is some application there, but uh, of course your mileage may vary, and uh, and so, and, and I don't have uh, 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 personal exposure to that particular problem. I got plenty of dials here that are are faceplates that I could uh, crack, but I'm not in uh, any mood to, uh, to crack one in order to see how it works not in the name of science huh? yeah, yeah another thing i wanted to mention is you know i know a lot of people will paint their radios for whatever reason but if you look back at the radios that you strip and refinish i think that the latex paint that people use to cover the wood radios actually preserves the veneers nicely on the radios as long as they weren't damaged prior to put that latex paint on it. So if you take care and strip them, I think you get you get a nice veneer out of it. But that's, I just think that's, that's my, that's been my, like you said, my mileage. Uh, your mileage might vary, but for radios that I've had a strip down that have been painted with latex, that's always the case that the veneers are, are super nice underneath them. Well, that was the case with that filter I did, but the problem was on top, it wore them through. There was the old plant uh, ring on top. And of course, then the latex paint gets down in the grain of the wood. And that's very difficult to remove once it gets down in the grain of the wood. Once you get that paint in there, you got to do some yeah, serious scrubbing. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I still have little tiny flecks of blue in, in this radio yeah. in little spots. But uh, what, was, that, was that glass you had convex? Yeah, it, bul it bulged out. Yeah. Yeah, that made it a little harder to find one then. Otherwise, yeah. you could go to a glass shop and just have a flat piece of glass cut. But yeah. Yeah. Nice job, Tom. Well, thank Excellent. you, Dale. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, it looked like Martin uh, got ready there. I saw that. Yeah. Martin, you want to try sharing your photo again? And turning your camera back on. Well, thank you all for uh, letting me talk for a few minutes this morning. I have had a very interesting uh, experience recently due to a lot of research. And I have found a person who can 3D print antique radio parts, antique radio plastic parts. Took me a long time to find this fella, but um, I had him do some work for me in the last month and it just turned out fantastic. So uh, what I wanna do is take you to the uh, first project I had him do for me. Uh, you will recognize these as Zenith knobs. Uh, uh, I hope everybody's seeing this. Yes, and we see the knobs. Perfect. On the left is a set of knobs that were on an antique radio that I picked up. And of course, those were just gone. And the Zenith knob in the center is one that I had uh, from another radio. So that was kind of my master. And the six knobs on the right side of the screen were done by the 3D printing process. I think they turned out really, really well. Those and nice. what's that, uh, Tom? Oh, those are nice looking. What, what did you have to pay for that? Uh, yeah, I'll get to that. Uh, uh, 
Now, the one thing that's missing on the, on the 3D printing knobs, of course, is the, is the Z logo, the Z logo. And uh, the fellow operating the system, uh, 3D system, 3D printing system said that uh, his software was not able to reproduce that Z, the logo. But I thought later it was probably a good idea that he didn't reproduce the Z because maybe that would be a patent infringement. I don't know. <laughs> So uh, these knobs will go on a current uh, Zenith wood radio that I'm uh, uh, working on and hopefully done in the next week, I hope so. So that was the first project I had him work on. Then uh, I recently purchased this trip light AC antique voltmeter. And between the uh, screw on the top and the body of the meter, there's some plastic insulators. And on the original meter, they were just crumbling. You just touched them and they crumbled. So I was able to save one and take it to the 3D printer. Uh, and the little uh, four, no, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, the five completed pieces on the center of the screen are, uh, are what he did. And they just fit absolutely perfectly. So I now have a restored trip light AC voltmeter uh, and uh, fully, fully functional. Uh, the guy does amazing work. And here's a close up uh, of, um, yeah, here's a close up of those uh, insulator, plastic insulator pieces. Then the next thing I had him working on, work on was, sorry for going back and forth here. Um, hold on. Uh, I picked up this uh, AC, uh, this DC voltmeter uh, from Western Western Industries, and the mechanical meter centering uh, screw there uh, was broken. So I took it apart and I took it to the 3D printer fellow, and uh, here's what he made for me. Uh, the one on the left it was the original with a broken plastic piece. So he recreated the plastic body and then instead of using a plastic uh, piece that would adjust the uh, meter, he put in a metal piece. And this will never break. It's just an amazing solution uh, on what uh, my 3D printer guy uh, that I discovered uh, did just really amazing, and uh, now I have a fully functional DC voltmeter, only up to thirty volts, but it's good for looking at the uh, uh, low DC voltages. So um, I asked uh, my fellow if he would like to do more of this work, and he said yes. So I have here a copy of his uh, contact information, his business card. And he's a general manager at a hobby town facility in Orland Park. And uh, he is willing to do more antique work. And I told him that I'd be mentioning this to the uh, Archie Club. And he said that he'd look forward to hearing from us. Uh, now, Tom, you asked me about cost. Um, not cheap. Uh, this reproduction of these six uh, Zenith knobs uh, cost $40. And I believe it was also 40 for a combination of the meter set piece and these plastic uh, insulators for the trip light meter. So it's not inexpensive, but if you have a piece that you just cannot find and you've got a master, uh, uh, Steve over at Hobbytown is going to help you recreate it and complete your project. It's a really, really good good uh, deal. It takes about a week <coughs> and um, he does the design software as well. So once he has these files in his system, they're there forever. So he can, if I called Steve today and said, hey, I need more of those Zenith knobs, uh, off, it, off he goes with the software that he already has in his system. So it's a hell of a resource for us. Again, if you're missing knobs or you want to recreate, recreate a special knob to finish your project, uh, 
uh, here's a resource for us. Okay, well, thank you, Martin. That's very informative and that's, that's a, a really fascinating way to go about getting something restored on, on an antique radio. Yeah, thank you, Tom. I appreciate the opportunity. Now, I have something else I want to share with the group. Um, I wrote a article for the club publication, for the Archie publication, and Maureen tells me it will be in the October issue. I did some research over the summer uh, on the subject of what Chicago area AM radio stations still play music or some music. And of course, as you know, there's no one station in Chicago AM radio station playing music, but there are several who do play music either on certain days or certain times of the day. So I put together a uh, Excel spreadsheet listing all of the AM radio stations that I could monitor here in Bridgeview uh, playing music. And uh, I wrote a backup article for that. And all this information will be in the October issue of the Archie, uh, Archie magazine. So we'll have a chance to actually hear some music on your uh, restored radios. I hope you guys enjoy the article. I'd love to hear back and see what you think about it. Great. We look forward to that, Martin. That's All right. Thank you. Now I'm going to turn this thing off and let you guys carry on. <laughs> I have a question for Martin. Oh, uh, hold on. Okay, go ahead. Of the Zenith knobs that you had reproduced, uh, did they do the inside of the knob too so that they would fit on the shaft in a proper manner? Oh, great question. Uh, the original knobs, of course, have, uh, what would you call a spiral or, or uh, cutouts that grab onto the tuning shafts. Right. And of course, he could not recreate that. So what he did is he made the hole just a little bit smaller. And on my particular radio, the knobs fit perfectly with just enough pressure to keep them, to keep them in place. And I'll, when I finish the restoration, I'll probably put just a little dab of glue on there so that they stay. But he's not able to reproduce the inside, but he did adjust it so that it will stay on the shafts. Okay, thank you. All right, very good. Okay. And, and Martin, if you, if you wanted to share that spreadsheet with the group, you could use the file share function in the chat window. Uh, thanks, Matt. I'll uh, I'll probably do that. But Maureen said she was going to be able to recreate it in the magazine, but I, I'm fearful that the print of the font's going to be really small to get the whole sheet in there. So I'll make that available to the group. Terrific. Thank you. All right. Well, are are there any other show and tells uh, at this bat? I'll say thank you very much for attending today, and let's proceed to the open. <laughs>